gonna tell you. Not much. I'm gonna tell you. Not much you can do. You got an old meter? You can check the ground. How many in here has a meter? Any of the utilities have a meter? Okay. You'll be able to do it. Y'all got a meter? Okay. Well, that's that's not bad. We'll, we'll do some. How many of you know how to use it? How many of you know how to use it? Okay. I don't need the No, maybe. Oh. The insulation resistance meter. Okay. We'll go over that a little bit. Anyway, test the motor. We're going to test the motor. You walk up, you've got three leads. Pretty much the test you're going to do is you're going to check your voltage. That's your first. Well, let me back up. The motor fails, it's tripped out. We've got a problem. Okay? Because you're not going to be testing it if you ain't got a problem. Alright, we've got a problem. We've determined, theoretically, we're going to say we've determined every, all the controls is okay. All the controls, I mean, all the controls is fine. Now we're going to test the motor. We've got three leads coming. We're going to turn our meter on ohms. We're going to hook it up here. One on one. One on two. We're going to read ohms. And as long as we're within plus or minus five percent balance on our reading between each three phases, each of your three lines, A, B, and C phases, as long as you're within plus or minus five percent balance, that's as far as you can go. Now, turn the power back on. Got the motor unhooked. We're going to. This is where it can get a little bit unsafe when you're testing. Here we have got some leads coming in here. And we need to test voltage right here. Because that wire runs through 200 foot of conduit back to the control panel. Well, if I check it at the bottom of the contact, and I've got voltage, I've got 200 foot of water that's not tested. So how do I go about testing this? You got your brand new meter alligator clips. <laughs> or you have, shut the video down. <laughs> I'm going to tell you all. I'm going to tell you shut the video camera off. <laughs> <laughs> you got out here, please. Flip them on your wires. Got your meter in hand. You're talking to your buddy on the cell phone that's back in the control room. Turn the power on. Then you have your buddy on the We've got 480 volt, 480 volt, 480 volt. Alright, so we verified we've got there. Alright, the next, the most important test about a motor. Is that right there? I ask people when they put a pump in or they start a motor, how many amps is it pulling? Greg, how many amps is it pulling? 31 E South. 30. That's about right. Anyways, know that. Amps tell you everything. The clogs or everything. That's right. If it ain't pulling, if you've got a motor that's rated at 30 amps and it's pulling 10, you ain't pumping. It's just sitting there spinning. You've got a clog line or something. Impellers come off. Impellers come off. It's good to look at that when making your rounds at the plant too. You've got digital reading of how many hertz your pump's running and how many amps it's pulling. It's good to have that in your back of your head or wrote down somewhere so you know what the normal operation is. So if you've got a clog, you know what's going on. I think uh you guys at this field, don't y'all go around and monitor that? Y'all check your amps at your stations pretty often, pretty. <coughs> Greg, you do that too, don't you? Going to. Going to. <laughs> You've been going to three years. <laughs> <laughs> you got a three meter. That's what you've been waiting on. <laughs> Anyways, I've got some customers that 
monitor amp. And I've got a, they'll call me and say, hey David, I've got a, I've got a pump that's amps has changed. What could be the deal? I tell them some stuff to check. And most of that amp change is going to be electrically. There's not, if, if the amps is right, you've got no worries. If, if we're under full load of amps, we've got no worries. This motor is half. But when he goes over full load amps and he starts getting into service factor, heat, heat decreases this life of this thing tremendously. Right up. Remember, when you put a pump in, <laughs> check the amps. Tells you everything. If it's not pulling full load amps, it should pull full load amps right off the start. Pretty close. Of course, it's going to spike up on startup, but it should pull pretty close to full load amps. Now, if you've got a lot of head on this pump, if you've got a pump, say, rated at 30 amps, and, you've, and it's a... Uh, most uh, submersibles and centrifugal pumps are designed not to, the impellers are designed not to be a non-overloading impeller. So, most of the time it'll pull full load and full discharge. Quick question for everyone. If I put head pressure on a centrifugal pump, is it going to load the motor or not load it? That's right going to have less load. The more pressure I put on it, the less it's going to pump. So the less the motor is going to be under load. So if you've got a pump, and I said, when we repair a pump in the shop, a submersible sewer pump or water pump, we drop it in the tanks and we pump it at full, full flow right out. So we're getting full load. So I'm running this motor, this pump, and it's max flow. All it can do. Full load. Now you put uh, you put the pump in, you put 85 foot of head on it, your amps is going to come down. Now Greg has got some pumps in Scottsville down there that is what we call, what we call high head impellers on them. And they'll flat overload themselves if they ain't got the proper head on them. I mean when we run them in the tank of 40, uh, 40 amp motor or full 60 amps. You can you can change you can help your efficiency in your plant too if you design your wet well to hold control higher wet well it puts more head on the pump and right. the pump more for you at less hertz right so you got to be careful with that making sure that you get just because you pull a pump out of this station over here don't mean that it's going to work over here sometimes we have to. That's understanding. Any other questions about electrically testing it? Real quick, one of you, I've got something else on the land. One of the best things you can do when you walk up to something and you're going to look at something, the most important, I'll give you a good lead. But your five senses can tell you more than an electric meter can most of the time. Touch, feel, sound. Probably the most important instrument we got is our sales. So remember that. I mean, if it's obvious, it's obvious. But, you know, it's learn way. to use your instincts to test. Them. You know, I know those things around the lift station. Boy, them right there, when they burn, they got uh, different kinds of things. And we, just to give you an idea, capacitors, everybody's got a uh, capacitor in the, here's a capacitor, your meters, I did buy a meter for everyone that's got capacitance testing on it. Turn it on the MFD rating. Turn it on. You gotta let it sit there because it has to read the capacitance. And I'll pass something around, y'all. So that'll measure 
Well, I just I just thought about that because our, our one guy that works in our department, he's our HVAC, and he was just talking about that the other day as far as so the guy the guy at his house, his capacitor on his air conditioning, he pumped was that yeah. swirling, and he was talking about yeah. testing. Right. And you've got to have, not all multimeters have capacitors reading them. But I made sure because I know single phase is a nightmare. And most all the utilities have got some single phase stations. And I wanted to make sure I got a meter that has a capacitor meter on it. So everybody can have it test. 415 is a 404 NMD. I'm sure you're on the This shows 415. Okay. Let's talk about a starter relay. Everybody know what a starter relay is in a pump panel? It's a little black box that you see in control panels that's, uh, we're talking about the capacitor, testing the capacitor <laughs> on the pump. If this voltage, remember what we talked earlier on the single phase motor, the next centrifugal switch opens up at, say, 1,000 RPM, but when it does, it drops this capacitor out of circuit. If this thing stays in circuit for a couple of seconds, it's going to blow. So, most of the time when this blows, it's staying in circuit. That can cause by the pump station, by the start relay, your pump's clogged, it's not spinning, so your readings is not right on your start relay. So, it can be the motor too. It can be the motor too. It doesn't get up to speed quick enough, say it's dragged up a little or something, turn it slower, then it will pop. Those start relays use a voltage to amp ratio, and I'm not real familiar with them. The way I test them is I pull one out and put another one in. <laughs> they're good to have as far as. But anyway, they're, uh, these here, if they stay in circuit too long, they'll blow. Sometimes, they sound like a shotgun when they go off. Especially they charge too much. Right. Right. Toss a screwdriver. Oh yeah. And always when you're testing them, take your screwdriver and short it out. Because they will hold energy. Remember, they store it. And they hurt. Can you do that right there? Oh my god. <laughs> Between it 
in the case. Whether it's in your leaf bar, your insulation, in your slots. Uh, if you've got a magger, I tell everybody, if it mags above one, you can probably run it. But be looking at something. And that's one mega hole. So that's one million holes. So we get motors in. What we like to see them is, is to re plumb off the chart. We call it infinity. But they don't a lot of times. And usually that usually this is caused by moisture. I can see low resistance readings be caused by moisture. I can cure those problems by simply warming the motor up. A lot of times all you gotta do is start the motor, you're testing the motor and you're getting a pretty low resistance to ground. Start the motor up, let it run, see if it dries out and the test. You know, if it's still running. A lot of people do this insulation resistance test as a uh, pre preventive maintenance test. They go around and do this once every six months and test these. If you see this and you've got a motor that's sitting, sitting idle, it's been idle for a couple of days, fire it up. I mean, you test it, oh boy, this thing's testing a little bit low. Well, fire it up and let it run for 30 minutes and see if it does. And probably what you want to do, though, is start to schedule this thing to go back to the shop to get redid at some point. But anyways, the... The electrical resistance test is just measuring your resistance from your uh, higher water to ground. And we'll let everybody do this after lunch. We'll do this in the test and we'll show you how it's done. But all you're, all you're, mostly all you're doing is you're touching this to ground and your lead water. And you're checking your resistance from Ground Any questions on that? <coughs> in the shop, now, if you've got a measure, that's good out in the field. Still don't necessarily mean that that's the problem. You can get a low reading and it still be not the problem. We're still testing, we're still saying the motor's good. By all the tests we've done so far, we're, we can still say that this motor is good, but it's still be bad. If you understand what I'm saying. When we get in the shop, you still can't get it to run, so you can that this is just a quick to tell you what we do. We get this thing in the shop, this here is called a surge tester. I can put this particular model here, 12,000 volts into this motor. And it's going to tell me, I'm going to test phase to phase, coil to coil, turn to turn. I'm going to test all this insulation in this motor. I'm going to test between each of those copper parts that I told you a while ago if they touch. So we make I'm going to test When I put this voltage in there and it runs through there, it gives me a reading on this screen. And all it is is an oscilloscope. And it's testing two phases at a time. And if, they're, and if they're different, then it'll show up different. And we'll go over all that later in the activity portion. In the afternoon, we'll get up here and we're going to get to play with all this equipment. So, uh, any more questions on electrical testing of the motors? So we're measuring that resistance. You want a high number instead of a low from uh, lead to ground? Yes, you want... Infinity is what you really want. Alright. You, you understand what I'm saying? I want this reading to go a million mega ohms if I could get it. Because that means I have no resistance to ground. I'm, I, you know, I'm pretty much completely insulated from ground. Can you, can you own those to ground yeah, yes, and that's the test. It's all on the ground. If they show grounding, oh, you've got a good ground. Put them over the ground. You know. I mean, that's obvious. I mean, and I'm sorry I missed that. I mean, that's, I ain't touching it. Anyways, when you own your motors, if you're off balance more than 5%, 
Probably pull them over. Because they should be within plus or minus 5% of each other. That reading. On their own reading. And when you get into bigger ones, I mean, you're probably going to see 0.2 ohms, 0.3 ohms. You know, you're going to be reading that. And you have to have an obvious short to pick it up with a multimeter. Remember, amps tell you everything. You crank that amp meter on there and you fire that motor up and it's pulling more than full load, shut it off. Figure out why it's overloaded. You don't now, have to check one when you check all of them. Huh? Check all of them. All right. Or... <coughs> Let's talk about that real quick. Each lead on a motor, if, if I'm rated, this motor here is rated at 460 volt and 0.7 amps. That means every lead can carry 0.7 amps. Every phase lead. Now, sometimes on the bigger motors, y'all might see this out in the fields. They've got parallel leads. Or you might have a wide delta starter where you've got six leads. Then, remember, every phase can handle whatever the full load dance is. So if you've got six leads and your motor is rated at, you've got six power leads and your motor is rated at 30 amps, you can only have 15 on each lead. If you're checking individual six leads. And I don't know how it does it, but it splits it up right down the middle of the I've wondered that many times how I you can have two wires and didn't know to put 15 here and 15 here. You can only put so much through your wires like this. Right. So it's just like a water hose. What do we have? Uh, <laughs> let's go over uh, wiring diagrams. Let's look at them a little bit. Page 12. I just took a picture of some wiring diagrams or probably pages of wiring diagrams from one of our motor manufacturers we work with. Anyways, single phase, single rotation. Ideal right there. <laughs> two wires, two lines. Can't hardly go wrong. No reversing. But single phase reversible <clears throat> rotation. Usually always on single phase motors. And I know this will be hard, but when you see single phase motors to reverse the rotation, you're going to interchange T5 and T8. On all single phase motors to, that I know of. Now, when you get into metric stuff, you're getting into different numbering terminology. But to reverse rotation, invert five and eight. That means you just swap where they're at on the schematic. Like this one, we've got T5 and T1 together. Where T8 is right there, you just put T8 over here and T5 over there to reverse the rotation. It's real simple. This is one of the hardest things that I have people that we get calls about. How do I water my motor up? Most all motors have that diagram on them somewhere. And for some reason, and I know I've had the problem myself, I mean, sometimes they're tough to read. But look at them and think about it. I mean, uh, for instance, well, there I'm coming forward again. That right there. There's no line going to that. You got L1 and L2. That's line one and line two. On a single phase, you've got two lines. Three phase, you've got three lines. L1, two, and three. Anyways, L1 and two. You see L2's just got one wire going to it. 
And you would be surprised at the people that will try to put a line up here to where it don't go. But when you see these terminology, T, Terminal 1, Terminal 5, T load, that's your load, that'll be your motor lead. Else, your line, that'll be your incoming. On your contactors, you'll notice on all your controls that we'll go over a little bit later, they have a line side and a load side. And L1's your positive, L2's your negative. There's not positive and negative. Well, I'm saying as far as a single phase. There's not positive and negative on single phase. It's just either one. We call it black, you call it black, white, black, red, whatever you want to call it. AC, there's no positive and negative. When DC, you have positive and negative. Right, well, I'm saying it's for whatever your hot wire is. Right, you can have a hot wire. Say on 115 volt, we've got a hot wire and a neutral. Right, that's what I'm saying. The other one would be your hot, and then. It, don't, it really don't matter. I can put my hot wire on four or my hot wire on one. It don't matter. The motor don't care. Is, is that the same entrance, uh, instance as like a normally open and normally closed solenoid? You can swap the wires on those two. What now? Like if you have a solenoid that's a normally open and normally closed, can you just swap the wires on those two and get it to work the other way for you? No. You have to find the power source where it needs to go to and when it needs to enter that. That's but normally, we, we had an instance that worked a while back. That'll be in the, the mechanical part of the valve if you're needing a, whether it's normally closed, it's really not going to matter. You just have to energize it when it needs to be energized. Right. Okay. AC, there's no positive and negative. Okay? You either have a hot, something like on the hot. Right. Yeah, hot neutral. Okay. Well. All right, how many of you on the control? Here we are the control. But how many of you on the control transformers ever checked your voltage and you got 75 and 45 for your 120 volt? You got two hot volts, but one of them is really a neutral. But I mean, you don't have 45 volts on one side of it. 75 on the other, whatever it is, to add up, but it'll be some <coughs> ratio like that. Anyways, when you're doing this. Just try to follow your wiring diagrams. This is several different wiring diagrams that I've got in the book here. Uh, on three phase, uh, you want the book blurry? Yeah. yeah. My goodness. Well, I'm getting sleepy, but it's not. <laughs> Just look at the cross side. Okay. You'll probably see this motor right here is probably a light connected motor. Most of your small stuff is what we call a light connected motor. You'll see up here at the top, for low voltage, it's a dual, dual rated motor, nine leads. Light connected. You've got four, five, and six tied together. You see them right there? Those, those bars, that means those bars tie together and tape off. When that means tape off, put a wire nut on it and insulate it. You may not even be a wire nut. It may be so big a wire, you've got to use some kind of big lug. But they've got to be insulated. Then you come down here, you've got your L1, L2, and L3. You've got two lines going to, or two wires going to each one of them. Real quick, anybody know about series and parallel circuits? All right, low voltage, parallel, high voltage series. Probably don't mean much, but if you know it, might help you a little bit understand. Low voltage with a parallel in this motor. We've got a couple more amps, so we put the wires in parallel. So we can cover twice as many amps. High voltage, you put it in series. And your amps drop, your voltage is up. Anyway, series and parallel. This particular motor, this night lead motor, we call it a wire connected motor. Low voltage, it's two wires. You see that wire right there? We call that a wire. So those three wires is tied together because it comes up and makes a wire in the motor. When your leads come up and come together inside the motor, it actually makes a wire. 
looks like a black. So you might hear it star connected. I don't know if you ever heard it called star connected. Anyways, low voltage is too wide. We're going to make one right there. The other one's internal. The manufacturer puts it inside the motor, and when we rebuild the motor, we put it inside the motor. This one right here, we got, when we're running on high voltage, you've got one wire going to each lead. You're going to take those two, <coughs> one of those two together. Think of it like a calculator. I'll tell you this, for star wide connected motors, you got one, two, and three is your leads. Tie four and seven together, five and eight, and six and nine. If you, if you look at your calculator, keep hands. If you look at your calculator, keep hands. You know, one, two, and three is your leads, and then four and seven you're going to tie together is up. You take off five and eight and six and nine. <coughs> Anyways, but. We have wide connected motors and delta connected motors. You see here, here's a delta. Two delta and one delta. Low voltage and high voltage. This is a nine leads. If you'll see there, you have one, seven, and six. You can see that in the book. You've got to follow these lines. This is where it can get hurt because this is what it's going to look like on this motor nameplate. Or wherever you're looking inside the wire box cover. This is what you're going to see. How you've got to follow your line. It comes up, you got knot, knot, and knot. And then all the motor line one. So we're on a low voltage connection on a delta connected nine lead motor. We're going to have three wires to lead. High voltage, we're going to go back to series connection, and you're going to have one one coil or one bar to lead. All right, that's pretty much covered your basic motor today. We're going to get into wide delta. Anybody in here ever dealt with wide delta motors <coughs> or part widening? Why delta motors? I probably get more calls on this than I do anything else. How do I hook the motor up? It's called Y Star Delta Run. They start the motors on a Y connection for because it's a little bit easier to start. When you don't pull as many amps, when it gets up to speed, we switch it over to delta. Does that have to do with torque though? That why we need more force? No, no, actually less. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's just a, it's an energy savings, it's a, it's a soft start mechanism. More of an energy savings. Say I've got a 200 horsepower motor when I started on the Y, probably 75 horsepower on the Y connection. So I'm not going to get as many amps on startup. Now if you've got a constant torque application where I'm starting a big load, it may not start the load. You know why I'm not, you know, why not having enough power to start the load. Anyways, when you get into these connections, follow your lines. And I can go over them. We can go over every one of them. It's going to take for days. So I just want just make sure you follow your connections. Does anybody got any questions? They want to know more about all these connections. You were talking about earlier, I guess, because I was telling you a break. I guess I had wired that motor up, but I didn't. Uh, was, there was no wire in that, and I taped it. Yes. It wasn't enough. You said make sure they're insulated, because I guess the reason that what would have been the reason why. Well, that's, that's, that's a lot more. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, they just, we take the motors. But I mean, it's just for the smoke, but it has to be a You don't get a good enough connection. Connections is everything. When you have to turn, when you make a connection, Make sure it's a sound connection. You put a wire nut on there, how many people use wire nuts? <coughs> Everybody in it. Pull, try to pull them out. If you can pull it out, it's not a good connection.
Come back and look. I've got some pictures in here just for y'all to look at. I've got these pictures pulled up. These are just failures. You send your pump in. I repair a pump. Uh, and uh, you said, hey, this thing failed. We put it in, it failed in one day. I want to cover it under warranty. And I open that pump up. And it's got that failure pattern right there. I say, hey, buddy, you say this lazy pump. That's not my problem. Right, Greg? I wouldn't be that smart. I mean, I'll, I'll be a lot, lot more important. I'll be a lot more leading into it, you know. You know, you have to try to tell people they're wrong in a nice way. Let them think they're right, but be wrong. <laughs> anyway, just to, this is just for reference only. I mean, you can see these pictures. When I get a motor in, pretty much I can tell you exactly why it's fixed the electric. What it costs. So, and of course I'll have people argue with me. At the end of the day, the customer's always right. Unless it's me. <laughs> you think it's a warranty job from the <laughs> Now, we get them wrong sometimes. Don't we, Greg? <laughs> <laughs> Greg, it's say it all. Sound, I mean, sound. Greg, if, it, if there's ever been yeah. something happen, <laughs> we, Greg's had to happen. We've been over about everything. His fault, my fault, fault. So, I can honestly say it's a lot less on your side than it is ours. Thank you. Okay. Where are we at here? So y'all look at them pictures if you want. That's mostly for me. I look at that, but I just wanted you I think it's a good reference for everybody to look at. That way you know that I'm not shooting you a line of bull. And you know your shop is not shooting you a line of bull. But most times we can tell about any motor shop in the Let's see where are we at. Where are we going to be at? Lunchtime? And I ain't even through all of them. What are we going to do? Oh, the way I'm supposed to be tested. Yeah, it's tired of it Yep. <laughs> How about we just have a working lunch today? That works. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not doing that. I have to do that most days. I ain't doing it today. <laughs> Yeah. Real quick while she's getting lunch ready. Control, control shooting. We'll just go over it. There are pictures of the control panel. This is a lot of different ways to test. Here's our simulated control panel. There is testing this, and this is this is where my this is where I really felt that we could make some progress with having this class. Is it permanent? Is it this or this? So when we get into this, it's pretty much easier when we get into talking about this and when we get into our hands on and we try to do, do everything there because. We want to know if it's this bad or this. We'll test. I've got contactors and breakers and stuff up here. I'll show y'all how to test everything. Everybody wants to. I want to cover this a little bit while she's getting ready. Uh, pumps. How many people in here has ever put their pump in and don't pump? It runs fine, but it don't pump. We have. I know you have, Greg. <laughs> anyway, if a motor runs, a uh, pump is a basic machine. It's got an impeller, and if it's turning, it's got to be good stuff. Now, what's causing it not to pump? Something's keeping it from. Okay. One of the biggest problems in the world is air. Air locks can cause nightmares. I've seen people spend thousands of dollars over a week hole being stopped up. You drop your pump in the hole and it don't pump. 
make sure the weep hole is not stopped up. I'm talking a little hole that's drilled into the loop on about all the brands of pumps. Make sure that weep hole is not closed up. I've seen, I mean literally, I've seen municipalities spend thousands of dollars on pump repairs when there was nothing wrong with them. And uh, sometimes they spray, but sometimes them vent holes is pretty big, and they'll spray a big stream of water out, don't they, Greg? Yes, You even think it's leaking. Yes. But it's not, it's just a vent hole. Usually your station never pumps down low enough for you to see it, but if somebody gets the off load set too low, then it can. You'll see a big stream shooting up out of there and think you got a low pipe and it's just your weak We actually had a sump pump we just put in uh, last year. We had in reading the instructions made, we had to put a weak hole in the discharge side of the pipe. Huh. I mean, I've had it before and didn't have to, and I drilled a hole in the blue. Yeah, this one here, it was, it was a small light. It's kind of like a grind pump, just for a sump pump down the pit, but it showed to drill a hole up above where it threaded in. I was like, come it in. Drill it in and then work like a champ. Pumps, as I say, basic answers. If they're not pumping, check your. It's for sure not electrical. If that motor's running, it's not the pump's problem. If that impeller's turning, it's not the pump. You know, as long as your rotation is correct, we're assuming that everybody check their rotation. Of course, you know, what are we doing when we assume it? It's not. Yeah. You and We had a pump last year in color. We didn't lose the shaft. Oh, I see that a lot. Uh, shafts broke off, shafts, impeller bolts come loose, fall off, bolts sit in there and run. I mean, uh, rocks and impellers. Somebody's got an impeller on a pump, make sure you ain't got no concrete rocks in there, right, Greg? <laughs> Call them and it to call it right after the repair. Set it out on top of the block. This is turning. Just wouldn't pump, couldn't get no water. Had the guys pull the pump. Yeah. I see the rocks in it. Oh, no rocks, swear to me. They can even come down and pull it up the rock right here in the rock. <laughs> so we've seen it all. I, I've had it. I've got it. Uh, a really good customer. You know, this always happens. This is tell you how this stuff happens. I've got a really good customer. And first job they called me on. The best of my memory would be the first sewer job. Get out here, we've got two pumps out in the same station. Well, how does that happen? I mean, you guys is in it. The odds of two pumps failing at the same time is slim. So probably this one other one's been out for a while. You just no, but anyways, we've got two pumps out at the same station. We were on a Friday or Saturday, they call us, blah blah blah. We turn this pump around in two days and have it back to them. Maybe even 24 hours, I don't remember. We keep a lot of parts and stuff. But anyways, we turn this pump around and take it back. Two days later, we know we get them one going two days and call us the day this pump is burned up. And I'm, is it, that's my reaction. Oh, here it is. I've done blow it again. <clears throat> so I get in my truck, I go to Bowling Green, and pull the pump out of the station. Concrete block stuck in it. Got the pump locked up. <laughs> <laughs> but that wouldn't like me to begin with, you know. So I get a back truck in there to suck clean the station. <laughs> Any more questions on troubleshooting pumps? Pumps is basic. You've got a motor that we talked about troubleshooting, and then you've got the hydraulics of the pump. And, you know, make sure you're pumping. You know, watch your amps. As he said, amps tell you everything that motor's doing. Clamp meters. A lot of people have never used them, I don't think, but use them. It tells you everything about what that motor's doing. When, I, when you call me and you've got a problem and I say, what's your amps? You tell me the full load amps on your pump and you
you tell me what amps it's reading, I can pretty much tell you if it's pumping or not. If it's got a problem. 